for those of you who are only here for today, let me explain to you that we have been studying in our services on recent Sundays Paul's letter to the Galatians. And it happens that this morning we are at the last of this series of sermons on Galatians. And we come to Galatians 6, where you would find it of great help to have your Bible open. And as we have our Bibles open before us, let's bow before God and pray. Father, we acknowledge our utter dependence upon your grace and wisdom as we turn to your word. We are like blind people, except you would open our eyes to see. We acknowledge how stubborn and disobedient we can be, except you touch our wills by your Spirit and conform them to obedience to your truth. And our hearts can be so cold and so dead before you, and we seek your grace that the Holy Spirit may quicken us this morning in love and gratitude to rise up and embrace all that you would say to us, and especially to yield ourselves to him who is our Savior. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen. Now, those of you who were here last Sunday evening might be excused for imagining that we had actually come to the end of our series of studies in Galatians. I did say we were at the very last paragraph and so on. But as I have opened my Bible here again and again this week, there is one verse that comes at the very end of the chapter. Indeed, it's the last thing Paul says before the benediction. And it has really stared out at me time and again as I have read these words. It's a very personal, I suppose almost a private statement, one might say, that Paul is making in chapter 6, verse 17. Finally, he says, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Finally, probably means from this time onwards. It's a word Paul uses uh, frequently when he's only halfway through his epistle to the encouragement of those of us for whom brevity is not the greatest of our gifts. He says, finally, and still he is another considerable part of his teaching to go through. But finally, probably means for the rest of the time. It has the idea for the rest, for the remainder, for the future. And what he is really saying is, in the future, for the rest of the time, possibly even for the rest of our lives, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. The background is fairly obvious, isn't it? More than in most churches that the apostle visited, planted a church, and wrote to later, he had suffered a great deal of verbal harassment from the church at Galatia, influenced and infiltrated as it had been by false teachers who had come to the church and sought to add to the sole ground on which Paul had taught them they would be saved, which was the finished work of Jesus Christ. And Paul calls this another gospel, and his soul is tormented by the thought that they might be diverted away from Christ to some other gospel which is not another. But these people had clearly challenged him. 
They had challenged him in areas of his life that touched the very roots and foundations of Paul's ministry. They had challenged his motives, for example, as a servant of God. And so in chapter 1, verse 10, they had clearly suggested he was a man-pleaser, and Paul seeks to answer this criticism of his ministry. They had challenged his integrity, so that in chapter 1, verse 20, he has to assure them before God that he is telling them the truth and not lying. They had challenged his consistency, so that in chapter 2, verse 5, he has to deny that contrary to everything he has told them he believed, he gave in to the Judaizers and had Titus circumcised. He says it was not so. Most of all, they challenged whether his ministry was genuinely of God or whether he was simply repeating things that other people had taught him. And so Paul defends the gospel that he has been preaching and defends himself against false accusation. But now at the very end of this remarkable letter, he says, well then, from now on, so far as the future is concerned, let no one trouble me. In other words, he is seeking quite manifestly, finally and completely to silence this aggravated criticism. And I wonder what you would think would silence his detractors. What would it be that Paul would call upon that would finally silence those who were harassing and calling in question the validity of his ministry? Would you think he might point to his success in other places? Not to say in Galatia, where he had planted so many churches, you know, on the basis, well, nothing speaks more loudly than success. However, we may disagree with the man. Look at what he's done. Look at the churches he has planted. Look at the effect of his ministry. Look at the statistics you could produce. He might even have somewhat more modestly said to them, look at the success God has given to me and given him the glory for it. But instead, Paul does one of the most extraordinary things that you will ever find in the New Testament letters. He is seeking to silence those who are opposing him and opposing the gospel and he stands back for a moment and points them not to his success, nor to his service, but to his broken, scarred body. And he says, let no one trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. He points not to his success, but to his suffering. Not to his service, but to his scars. Don't trouble me, he says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Now, all I want to do this morning is simply to ask two questions of this verse and of the statement of the apostles. First, what is the meaning of these marks that are clearly so important to Paul? And secondly, what is the message of these marks? Because obviously he sees that there is a message that they preach, a sermon in scars, which he wants them to hear. And then I want to apply it to ourselves. First then, what is the meaning of the marks of Jesus 
which Paul bore. If you were able to read this in the original, you would immediately recognize the word because the word has come right into our English language as well as in the Greek. The word for marks and singular is the word stigma. And you will know that we use that word ourselves, the stigma that some people bear. The difference is that in English, it's different from in Greek. In Greek, it is the ugly flesh-burning scar or brand that is left on a slave or an animal to identify it as belonging to someone else. In English, it is a scar, a stain, we would often say, on somebody's character or on their reputation. He has a stigma, you know. But it's something that we recognize and we are aware of. For Paul, these marks of Jesus were the marks of what he had suffered for Christ. And they were to him, and he intended they should be to them, the authentication that he was a true servant of Jesus Christ. Do you remember in Acts 9 when Paul was confronted by Christ on the Damascus road, going down towards Damascus, arrogant, cynical, and full of intent to destroy the church of God in Damascus, and suddenly the light blinded him and he was cast to the ground and he was brought to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And just three days later, God sent a man to see the apostle whom he had thus brought to himself, a man called Ananias. And Ananias was given a message from God for Saul of Tarsus. And the message was this. This man, he said, is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and people of Israel. I want you to go and open his eyes so that he may see and I will show him, I will show him what great triumphs he must exercise for me, what great service he must accomplish for me throughout the world, what a great future I have for him. No, that's not what God told Ananias to say. He said, this man is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and people of Israel. I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name. Now, Galatia was where Paul's first missionary journey touched upon in Acts 14. We read the story. And there is a remarkable account there of how in a place called Lystra, Paul was stoned and dragged outside the city and left for dead. In Acts 16 in Philippi, we read that he was stripped and flogged and jailed. And in 2 Corinthians 11:24, looking back over a period of his life longer than this, he tells us that he had received from the Jews these ghastly 39 stripes which ripped the flesh and left a man in anguish almost dead. And Paul had experienced it. Have you noticed this in 2 Corinthians 11? Not just once. But five times I received from the Jews forty lashes save one. So the once proud, unmarked body of Saul the Pharisee was torn and scarred and broken by his sufferings for Christ. And these marks are the marks of Jesus of which he speaks here. Do you remember how in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 he describes it? He says, We must 
those of us who are Christ's, we must recognize that we always carry around in our body the death of the Lord Jesus. Now let me just emphasize to you that the scarring and battering of his body which the apostle received was not the suffering of a criminal. It was the suffering of a Christian. And it was for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel that he had gone through this kind of suffering. He stood there before them. I wonder if you can imagine what they were recognizing. And the man who was writing the letter, I wonder if he turned and looked as Paul said, let nobody trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. And he may have taken off his outer coat. And there the man would have seen in the body of the Apostle Paul wheels and scars and wounds. And what a history of anguish they spoke of. So the meaning of the marks is the anguish and harrowing pain the apostle had endured for the sake of Christ. But what is the message of these marks of the Lord Jesus? For Paul clearly thought of them as a powerful message that would silence his critics and proclaim to them something that would close their mouths forever. As someone has said, these marks are the royal insignia of a true servant of Jesus Christ. There is no doubt that they were the evidence of several vital things. Let me just ask you to think about them with me. They were the evidence in the first place of his union with Jesus Christ. You will know if you know the New Testament at all that that's one of the cardinal truths that the Apostle Paul is concerned to impart to these young churches. He wants them to know that the very essence of what it means to be a Christian is that you are united to Jesus Christ. That personal faith has this significance. We believe into the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is a man in Christ. If anybody be in Christ, he is a new creation. Union with Jesus Christ is the very essence of what Christianity is all about to the apostle. And here in Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 20, for example, he expresses something of what it means, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet it is not I, it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's impossible for Paul to think of the believer apart from Jesus Christ. But what is the great mark of that union with Jesus Christ? Listen to what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and at verse 17. He tells us three things about the believer. He says our union with Christ makes us heirs together with Jesus Christ. That is when we are born into his family and adopted by God's grace, we become heirs together with Jesus Christ. And there is one word for that in the Greek. It is united to Jesus Christ. We are heirs with him. Then the other thing he tells us is that we not only are heirs with Christ, that, but that with Christ we shall be glorified. At the end of this life and the end of this world, we shall be glorified together with Christ. So, 
in Christ, in union with Him. We are united with Christ as heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We will be glorified together with Christ. But then he adds, if we suffer together with Christ. Do you notice that a vital element in our union with Jesus Christ, the guarantee indeed that we shall be glorified with Him, is not that we have believed. It is not even that we are heirs of incredible riches. It is that we suffer with Jesus Christ. If we suffer with Him, we shall also be glorified together with Him. And the marks of the Lord Jesus, therefore, my dear friends, have first of all this message, that they point to our union with Jesus Christ. So Paul, when he is speaking about coming to know Him, getting closer to Him, what does he speak about? What do you think about when you think about getting closer to Christ, coming to know Him more deeply? He says, I long that I might know Him and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable to his death. And Peter has the same note, he says in 1 Peter 4.13, you are partakers of the sufferings of Christ, the great evidence of our union with Jesus Christ is that we suffer together with him. So it's an evidence of Paul's union with Christ, these marks. They are secondly an evidence of his love for Christ. You could deduce that logically, couldn't you? There is an overwhelming argument in these cars of Paul's. We would say a man who suffered thus for Jesus Christ must certainly love him much, and it would be true. People don't go out into the teeth of the devil's opposition and out into the darkness of the world's persecution. They do not expose themselves to the anguish the apostle exposed himself to for nothing. Indeed, the reverse is the case. Do you notice how Paul is saying in Galatians 6 verse 12, the only reason they do this, that is, try to compel you to be circumcised, is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. They are not interested in Christ. They want to avoid pain for His sake. But when you get a man who is ready to say, I will follow this Jesus wherever He leads me. I will give myself absolutely and utterly to Him, come what may, cost what it will. You can be sure that there is a love there that is genuine and cannot be questioned. I say you can, you can tell it logically, but it's not mere logical truth. It's biblical truth. Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 20, the Son of God, he says, who loved me and gave himself for me, it is in his cross that I want to glory and boast that cross through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, when he has viewed the Son of God who loved him and gave himself for him, the apostle finds it the most natural thing in the world to say to his Christian brothers and sisters, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you offer yourselves a living sacrifice, your body a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. And it is because of the love that he has for Christ that these marks are there. Walking in the path of obedience for Paul was an infinitely costly thing to do, but his heart had been drawn away from everything else to him. And the scars made it manifest. So the message of these scars is that they speak of his union with Christ, of his love for Christ, and finally of his likeness to Christ. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, when Paul is speaking about his longing to be like him, you will remember how he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection becoming like him. What does it mean to become like him? Well, it means, he says in Philippians 3.10, to share the fellowship of his sufferings and become like him in his death. Now, that, of course, is exactly what Jesus taught when you remember in Matthew chapter 10. Let me read it to you. He says, prophesying to his disciples what their life is going to be like if they follow him. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student, now listen to this, to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And what Jesus is saying and what Paul found and what has been true for every Christian man and woman ever since is that likeness to Jesus Christ brings a sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings. And these sufferings are manifold and multiplied in their nature but they are the insignia of true servants of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you as we close, how do we apply all this to ourselves? You may possibly be saying to yourself, but we don't bear that kind of bodily suffering today. If we took off our shirt, we would not be seen to have backs that were scarred with wheels and wounds and battered by opposition that we had received in the service of Jesus, would we? Probably not, I would guess. But what about the stigma, my friends? What about the stigma? The stigma of being absolutely faithful to Jesus Christ in a godless society. What about that stigma? What about the stigma of being amongst colleagues who are going to pour scorn upon you because you stand out for Jesus Christ in the world? 
What about the agonies, the thousand agonies that God permits and takes and sanctifies in our lives because He is determined to make something out of us more than we are, to deepen His work of grace in our souls, and through the one instrument that so often produces men of Pauline caliber, namely suffering, to make us men like Paul. What about that pain of a thousand inward scars? Listen to these words of Amy Carmichael. Hast thou no scar, no hidden scar on side or foot or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar, no wound, no scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far, who has nor wound, nor scar? What I want to say to you this morning is that as you come to the end of your days and you are able to expose your life to the eyes of the world and say, here are the marks of the Lord Jesus upon me. And they are the marks of my union with him in his suffering, the marks of my love for him, the marks of my likeness to him. Then we may know that these are the insignia of the true servant of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we seek your grace this morning. So often we have regarded your service as something cheap and easy, almost like a hobby. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Have mercy upon us that we have been so eager to protect ourselves from anything that is costly. And in your mercy, enable us that we may be willing to bear the scars of him who loved us and gave himself for us. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.